Forum on Biodiversity, IIFB, is a caucus of indigenous representatives from the seven regions of the world, whose objective is to facilitate the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples in the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD for short. The Forest Peoples Program, is a human rights organization working with forest peoples across the globe to secure their rights to their lands and their livelihoods. They work alongside more than 60 partner organizations representing indigenous peoples and forest communities from across the globe. Lastly, Women for Biodiversity campaigns to amplify the importance in recognizing the roles and contributions of women in biodiversity conservation they, they also provide analysis and bring experiences from the local to the global level in advocating for women's rights to biodiversity conservation. And they do this by advocating to policymakers and by supporting their members' partnership in the decision make, in decision making processes. Again, welcome to our webinar this morning uh, titled Indigenous Peoples, Human Rights Principles and Epic in the Post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Indigenous peoples and local communities around the world have invaluable knowledge about how to live in harmony with nature. They are therefore key actors in the protect, protection of Mother Earth and should be seen as a central and cross-cutting part of the entire Convention on Biological Diversity and its post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Our panelists today will share the outcomes of the recent CBD sessional meetings held in Geneva in March 2022, and they will analyze and highlight human rights particularly indigenous and gender rights as reflected in the latest documents of the, of the future CBD post 2020 global biodiversity framework. These indigenous relatives and experts will present comments and, and will present results of the past sessions in Geneva on various issues, including traditional knowledge, recognition and respect of indigenous rights, gender and women, gender, women, and youth issues, inclusion of the of free prior and informed consent, and, and they will discuss ways for, the ways forward. So I'm very excited to, to have this awesome panel here today, and I want to present to you our first, our first speaker, and her name is Miss Tina, Tina Rai, she's a women's rights and environmental rights advocate and the director of Women for Biodiversity. Ms. Rai works on policy advocacy and research on the intersection of gender equality, women and girls' rights and environmental, ju environmental justice. She has been working for many years in environmental governance and human rights issues, particularly focused on integrating indigenous peoples, local communities, rights, including women's rights, into the decision of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Tina, I'm so happy to have you here today, and I look forward to learning more from you. So as an avid advocate for gender rights, why is it important to recognize women in biodiversity conservation and to ensure their equal participation in the post 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. You have the floor, Tina. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be here and also to be here for all the fellow Indigenous brothers and sisters to sharing this space and including this monumental event taking, taking place in New York under the UNPFII, a very relevant discussion to kind of bring together and bridge these synergies. So um, I was asked to share some of the key elements of the CBD and its gender uh, considerations within the framework, but also looking at where the discussions are right now until Geneva. Um, so I usually talk fast. So, so please um, guide me if I am, because I know there's interpretation there. So I have a short presentation to focus on some very key elements that work for us in Geneva and some ways forward um, until the next meeting, and also look forward to all the contributions and reflections from um, everybody uh, attending today. So thank you so much. 
So I'll share my screen and do let me know if it works. It, it's working. Okay. So once again, thank you very much. So um, what I would be focusing on um, is on gender, the environment links in particular to the CBD and the ongoing discussions on the post 2020 global biodiversity framework that is to be adopted at the CBD conference of the parties um, COP15 sometime later this year. So uh, without further ado, so um, I know that a lot of um, our colleagues may already be familiar, but I just wanted to quickly go through um, the CBD and the gender. So under the CBD, uh, there was a gender plan of action that was first uh, presented in 2008. Following that, um, under the uh, guidance of the CBD COP uh, uh, 13 in Pyeongchang in 2014, the, the gender plan of action for the time frame of 2015 and 2020 was adopted. Now, this was a very important document because a lot of us worked on it to really ensure how the IHA biodiversity targets would also be implemented with this guidance. Um, now, looking at the COP, looking at this work of the CBD, and we need to update this, but this is from uh, taking um, it until COP10, there are over 60 decisions with reference to gender of women um, since COP3. Those reflect on the focus on women's participation, women as stakeholders, um, importance of roles of women, gender roles, change gender relationships, and also reflects on taking into account concerns and interests of women include a gender perspectives and mainstream gender considerations. Um, I also want to really, a um, key element for a focus of a work has been that CBD, uh, the Rio Convention, is also one of the first Rio Conventions to have had a gender plan of action um, besides the, um, the, the UNCCC and the UNCCD, um, including uh, specifically mentioning or recognizing the roles of women in its preambular text. Um, looking at a lot of the work around biodiversity and climate change, uh, there was a COP decision 13-4, which also recognizing gender responsive approaches. There is a decision on 10-14-5, which looks at specific reference to rural women. And of course, ecosystem restoration 13-5. Um, this is also really very relevant um, on the ongoing discussions around the post-2020. Now, having said that, this plan was um, quite aspirational, but not implementable in a way that there were not actions related to what the countries, the party delegates um, could do to ensure that the IHA biodiversity targets would take this plan into consideration. Um, so uh, two years ago, it's already been two years, the CBD COP15 was supposed to take place in 2020 and at that, uh, together with this biodiversity framework, uh, th there was supposed to be the post-2020 gender plan of action to also be adopted. So as we have seen that over the pandemic and everything, the whole process, uh, the COP has been delayed for almost two years. Um, and so has then the adoption of also this post-2020 gender plan of action. So we see this also an opportunity because it's given us kind of also got a lot of time to really go through the go through it, um, look at it, and uh, the the CB secretariat has also worked around three rounds of of uh, submissions and different consultations, um, and then we have a, a draft that was presented at the SBI, which is the uh, subsidiary body of implementation uh, third session where this was taken up. So now what happened in Geneva? So like I said, there are two intersessional uh, meetings that takes place between the COP, one is the subset 24 and SBI 3. So like I said, under the SBI 3, the, the post 2020 gender plan of action, the draft of it was shared and negotiated. Um, so under the uh, SUBSTA, they have adopted 11 recommendations. Um, SBI has also focused on elements of the GBF and adopted 20 recommendations and decisions. 
while as the working group on 2020 just has been discussing the goals and the targets, um, we'll again be having another session. So in this, I just wanted to focus besides though that, you know, um, all these three meetings are very important in reference to a lot of different discussions. I'm going to focus on key two very gender specific elements, but also with the caveats is saying that that is not the only work that is relevant for addressing human rights or women's rights, but just as a focus of what happened in Geneva. So one of the key documents, um, very relevant, like I said, is the post-2020 Gender Plan of Action. Um, and this is, I'm again um, sharing this is because this is a really very important plan because the Gender Plan of Action, when adopted together with the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework is to ensure the gender responsive implementation of the whole framework. Um, so, what, so I just wanted to share that in Geneva, through the, all the negotiations, what has happened is that, that now the draft has almost been cleaned and will be taken up to the COP15. So basically it is on an L document with some remaining brackets. And I just wanted to showcase of um, some of the elements that were uh, heavily discussed during various contact groups and friends of the chair like some of the parties um, bracketing all genders, benefit arising from the utilization of, um, and of course, recognizing uh, clean, healthy and sustainable environment, because we think this is very important element uh, to also make sure that women and girls have a right to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment. And of course, one of the things that we have been proposing in the gender plan of action is the recognition to rights to ownership and control over land and natural resources and access to water. Having said that, there are some very key elements to be noted in the gender plan of action. One is that, that uh, one, it is implemented, it would also uh, see the guiding the implementation at the international and national level. It has an element there um, on the protection to women's environmental human rights defenders, which is the first time. Um, we have a, a provision there, a recommendation to have a dedicated national gender focal point and also a fund for uh, supporting women, um, women delegates. And this is where we wanted to also discuss because this fund, as we had proposed, was to ensure how women organizations, indigenous women, rural women, fisherwomen would also have a fund. I think we were looking at like a voluntary fund for indigenous peoples to really ensure the full and effective and meaningful participation of women's um, from, to engage effectively with the CBD. Um, so I'm just going to just want to kind of glance through this. And besides this, uh, this document, uh, this now will be taken up at the CBD COP15. So this will be one a document I would also request everybody, if you have a chance to really look into that, because there is still an opportunity for us to recognize that there are certain elements that you would like to see proposed, and we could definitely also um, work to ensure that those are also addressed or, or recommended for going forward. Now, that was one document that had particularly reference on gender. Um, in the around the whole work of the convention. So that's a very key document for us. Now, the other one is that the reflection I wanted to quickly share is what was taking place in the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework that was discussed under the working group. This working group is an ad hoc working group co-chaired by um, two, party, uh, two uh, parties, let say parties, one is from Canada, Basel, Ben Harv and um, from Uganda, we have Francis Ogwal. And looking at that analysis, there are 22 to, uh, 21 targets being proposed in the global biodiversity framework, which has a time frame of 30 years. So this blueprint for biodiversity is a 30 year plan with a way to <clears throat> review it at 2030. So now in this one, um, the, if you look at it, the, there is only target 21 that specifically mentions women and girls. I won't read the whole text, I will keep it here. So now um, understanding that there is this target 21 that uh, recognizes that, ha that has women and girls, 
Um, what we also felt that was it really did not do justice because what we really want to see is that, that the post 2020 gender plan of action as is now is also rather very ambitious. You know, you have um, environmental human rights defenders, you have uh, uh, women with uh, diverse gender identities. So that's great. So we want to see how this would be, um, this almost time is almost up, this would link so one of the key elements that we did around there was to have this proposal, which is in, in, in the uh, document uh, that is being led by Costa Rica is on a new standalone target on gender equality. So I'm going to kind of leave it there. So this is a new target in the global biodiversity framework that is there um, in the text for the working group uh, 2020 on the GBF. And this is what we thought was really very important to ensure that there is synergies with the GPA, but also to ensure that this target will also uh, align with all the 21 targets um, within the framework. So now what next? So I'm gonna quickly brush through this, um, apologies. Um, so this one would are now going forward from March, we have the uh, a fourth new session being um, organized in June in Nairobi, which will take place from 21 to 26. And that is where we hope to, wh where this target discussions will take place um, and um, including the proposal for the new target on gender equality. So I'm just gonna quickly go through that, is that one of the key um, achievements, or I must say that a, a advancement for all of us, for I think um, as, as a movement, as a group has been that for the first time in the global biodiversity framework, there is a possibility, a realization, a, you know, aspiration, putting together in this um, standalone target on gender equality, which is now supported by the whole of RULA, that is 33 member states, including some of the countries uh, from Africa. Um, one of the key elements, this is my last slide, um, work that we are doing is ensuring that, uh, that to ensure that the whole of the gender global biodiversity framework itself would be gender responsive is engaging in the work on the indicators. And this will also be a meeting that will be taking place right after June, um, um, at the end of June in Bonn. So because this is really very important because actually there's not many gender responsive indicators throughout this whole framework, including in targets 21 and others, including one, two, three, and others which are very relevant for um, women, but also for indigenous women. So, so I just put a note that there are 80 gender relevant indicators identified by the uh, interagency and expert group on gender indicators. And besides that, there are others that are specific that we could use for the GBF. Uh, this is just a closing, uh, what in a snapshot, what we are working on and what is really needed. And this is our contact, um, please get in touch and I'll be happy to also answer any further questions in detail. Um, and I will also answer, respond if there are any on the chat. So Monica, thank you so much. Sorry for the interpreters if I rushed through everything. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. And thank you for that very powerful presentation. You are absolutely right that women's rights are human rights and that we as indigenous women need to be included in the conversations related to this very important topic of, of biodiversity. And with that, I would like to invite and present to you our next speaker, um, Ms. Viviana Figueroa uh, is, Oma, is an Omaguaga indigenous woman and she is also an international consultant on traditional knowledge, indigenous peoples and biodiversity. She's the coordinator of the Argentinian Indigenous Youth Association and is a member of the Indigenous and Local Knowledge Task Force of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES. Ms. Figueroa has worked at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity as Associated Program Officer for Traditional Knowledge for more than 10 years. So she comes uh, to us with a wealth of knowledge. Um, she also holds a 
a PhD in law and a degree in international public law from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Uh, Viviana, thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about a human rights based approach, particularly at the recent CBD meetings. We would like for you to elaborate more on what do we mean when we talk about the human rights based approach? What is it and how are indigenous people's rights reflected in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework? The floor is yours, Ms. Viviana. Um, muchas gracias, Monica, y uh, um, a Cultural Survival por invitarme a, a ser parte de este importante panel y a todas las organizaciones que eh, están organizando este importante evento. Eh, es un gran honor para mí estar con ustedes. Buenos días, buenas noches o buenas tardes, dependiendo del lugar donde se encuentren. Eh, me pidieron que les mencione un poco el enfoque de derechos humanos, pero también con una focalización en lo que es el SPIC o el consentimiento libre, previo e informado, y eso es lo que voy a, a tratar de hacer. Cuando nosotros hablamos de derechos humanos en general, eh, bueno, son los derechos de todas las personas, y que originalmente tenían un sentido más eh, a nivel de las personas individualmente. Sin embargo, con la adopción de la Declaración de Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas de las Naciones Unidas, tenemos también la concepción qué es para los pueblos indígenas los derechos humanos o qué involucra. Entonces, eh, de acuerdo a, la, a, la, a lo que es el derecho internacional, los derechos humanos son inherentes a todas las personas que todos tenemos derecho a ejercer esos derechos humanos sin ninguna eh, discriminación y todos esos derechos están interrelacionados, son interdependientes e indivisibles. Y los países tienen eh, responsabilidades y obligaciones de respetar eh, nuestros derechos humanos. Pero para los pueblos indígenas, eh, los derechos humanos significan nuestros derechos colectivos, hacia nuestras tierras, hacia nuestros territorios, hacia nuestro patrimonio, como son eh, nuestros conocimientos tradicionales, a la preservación y protección de nuestras culturas. Ah, eh, y esto es, es un concepto muy importante porque este, antiguamente se decía, ¿no? por ejemplo, el derecho a la tierra no es un derecho humano, pero para los pueblos indígenas sí, porque si nosotros no podemos... Eh, vivir en nuestras tierras, no podemos ser parte de nuestros pueblos eh, si nosotros no tenemos derechos a, a, por ejemplo, utilizar la naturaleza, la biodiversidad, tampoco eh, podemos garantizar nuestro derecho a la vida. Por eso es que hablamos de que para los pueblos indígenas los derechos humanos incluyen derechos colectivos, o sea, no solamente derechos humanos, sino derechos colectivos. El convenio sobre la diversidad biológica este, reconoce un aspecto muy importante de nuestros derechos humanos. Uno es el derecho a decidir, ¿no? a dar nuestro consentimiento informado previo. Por ejemplo, cuando decidimos compartir nuestro conocimiento, que es parte de nuestro patrimonio, es parte de nuestros derechos colectivos. Este convenio en su artículo 8, inciso J, explícitamente reconoce que tiene, digamos, otros pueden utilizar nuestros conocimientos, pero con nuestra aprobación. Y este es un derecho fundamental al consentimiento libre, previo e informado. En el texto en sí original del convenio, que es de 1992, se hablaba de aprobación, pero eso con la adopción de las directrices voluntarias Muchcastal, se entiende consentimiento libre, previo e informado. También es importante recordar que el concepto de consentimiento libre, previo e informado, viene de la bioética, lo que surgió fue eh, para que los pacientes en sí eh, pudieran dar su consentimiento cuando eran eh, sometidos a ciertos tratamientos, ¿no? y más que nada el concepto de, 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 de libre. Y esto se digamos, se, se utiliza también para los pueblos indígenas porque lo, lo que ocurría en muchas ocasiones era que 
Eh, por ejemplo, había investigadores que llegaban a las comunidades y les hacían firmar eh, un documento y decían, bueno, esta comunidad ya dio su consentimiento, ya decidió compartir sus conocimientos. Pero en realidad ese consentimiento en muchas ocasiones, eh, la mayoría no era libre, porque a veces incluso tampoco era a las autoridades de las comunidades que, con las que se hablaba o se obtenía ese consentimiento, pero a su vez en muchas ocasiones también había este, presiones, como por ejemplo para la aprobación de ciertos proyectos que van a tener impacto en sus tierras, y asimismo tampoco era previo, porque en algunas ocasiones ese consentimiento era dado eh, o solicitado posterior a la realización de esa actividad. Por eso es que y después el consentimiento es informado porque se precisa para dar ese consentimiento que esté previamente, o sea, que la comunidad tenga toda la información. ¿no? Por eso es de que a nivel internacional, durante las negociaciones de la Declaración de los Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas, se introdujo el término consentimiento libre, previo e informado en todo lo que tiene que ver los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Entonces, en el... ¿Y qué es el marco global eh, y por qué es importante para los pueblos indígenas? El marco global es la nueva agenda ambiental mundial eh, para los próximos 30 años, o sea, va del 2020, pero en realidad ya estamos en 2022, hasta el 2030, hasta el 2050. Lo que están haciendo los países es eh, fijando o eh, acordando metas, a, acordando objetivos, acordando acciones, mecanismos también para monitorear esas acciones y esas metas, cómo se van alcanzando. No va a ser un instrumento obligatorio, pero sí, un, porque el convenio es eh, de carácter vinculante para los países, los países van a tener que adoptar sus propias estrategias nacionales en base a este, a este marco ambiental mundial, ¿no? Y nosotros como pueblos indígenas, específicamente en el Foro Internacional de Indígenas sobre Biodiversidad, en la red que estamos participando de las negociaciones de esta nueva agenda ambiental mundial en el marco de las reuniones del Convenio sobre Diversidad Biológica, necesitamos que este marco sea en base al respeto, al consentimiento, al respeto a nuestros derechos humanos desde la perspectiva de derechos colectivos, ¿no? y específicamente a lo que es el consentimiento libre previo informado. Como el marco va a tener, eh, tiene cinco objetivos y tiene 22 metas en este momento, solo me voy a referir a las metas que son este, relacionadas al tema de mi presentación. En la meta que incluyó en sí, o el objetivo que menciona este, los derechos humanos como el derecho humano a un ambiente sano, y, eh, es el objetivo B, está en las dos opciones, el texto que los países están negociando, es este, la opción 1 y la opción 2, en, en, en ambas opciones se incluyó el derecho a a lo que es el derecho al ambiente, a, a, al derecho al ambiente sano, y eso es un avance muy importante porque en el plan estratégico anterior y en decisiones anteriores de la convención siempre es como que no se incluía la perspectiva de derechos humanos. ¿no? Para nosotros esto nos parece muy importante. El tema en sí de, de la meta 13, los pueblos indígenas, consideramos eh, que, fue, que era importante la inclusión del término consentimiento libre previo informado para garantizar este, nuestros derechos sobre nuestros conocimientos tradicionales. Esta fue la propuesta del, del Foro Internacional Indígena antes de ir a, a Ginebra y eh, esta propuesta, eh, digamos, todavía... Eh, está, digamos, en el texto consolidado que surgió de Ginebra y que incluye el concepto consentimiento libre previo informado en, para el tema de conocimientos tradicionales asociados a recursos genéticos. O sea, el concepto en sí está, simplemente que todavía no hay un consenso, por eso son los este, corchetes, 
y que en la próxima reunión que va a, existir, que va a ser en Nairobi, ahí es donde se van a, a trabajar mucho más estos términos. ¿no? O sea, nuestra propuesta ha sido incluida en cuanto al consentimiento, eh, o sea, está el consentimiento libre previo informado, algunos países han, han puesto consentimiento eh, previo informado, o sea, hay una versión que es como más larga de lo que es el consentimiento previo informado, pero este, la perspectiva nuestra está incluida a pesar de que no hay consenso todavía. Esta es en la opción 1, que es la que más se ha discutido en la reunión. En la opción 2, eh, no se menciona este concepto tampoco en la tercera mención, con lo cual, como FIP, estamos considerando la, 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 digamos, la principal, ¿no? la que se discutió más. Eh, también este, el tema de consentimiento libre previo informado está en la meta 20, esta es una meta de una gran preocupación para nosotros y este es uno de los puntos que puede implicar una violación a nuestros derechos colectivos como pueblos indígenas, a nuestros derechos humanos, como les digo, para nosotros los derechos humanos no solamente tienen un carácter individual, sino también colectivo. Porque, este, si bien es cierto, se incluye el, el concepto de consentimiento libre previo informado, y ahora les voy a mostrar nuestra propuesta, eh, esta meta de los países lo que refieren es a la información y al conocimiento, que incluye conocimiento tradicional, y dice que esté disponible y accesible a los tomadores de decisión, a los profesionales y al público en general para eh, ayudar a los tomadores de decisión uh -huh. a lo que es el manejo de la biodiversidad, al monitoreo de la biodiversidad. El problema que vemos acá, este, que esta es la propuesta del FIP, estamos proponiendo que se elimine, que sea disponible y accesible a todos los tomadores de decisión, porque eh, por más que incluso esté incluido el concepto de consentimiento libre previo informado, el conocimiento tradicional no es eh, que está en un libro que yo le puedo dar a un tomador de decisión, a un ministro y decirle, bueno, tome ministro, acá está el libro, usted lea y empiece a este, implementar conocimiento tradicional. No, el conocimiento tradicional lo aprendemos desde que tenemos eh, uso de razón en algunos pueblos eh, hay un proceso para que aprendan conocimientos tradicionales desde los dos años a los siete, y está en los pueblos indígenas. Entonces, el concepto de, de entregar el conocimiento o ponerlo a disponibilidad eh, es realmente un grave riesgo. Nosotros en el FIP, esto, esta, esta perspectiva eh, se puso en el documento cero de las propuestas de los copresidentes sobre la meta en ese momento era la meta 19, y ahí lo que dijimos es que incluso que nosotros tuviéramos las mejores intenciones de este, poner a disposición el conocimiento para los tomadores de decisión, ellos podrían utilizarlo para otros fines, o sea, utilizarlo en otros contextos, eh, utilizarlo en forma... Entonces... Esa no es, este, una, es una concepción errónea de que nosotros tengamos que poner nuestro, nuestro conocimiento y lamentablemente a nivel internacional actualmente no existe todavía la Organización Mundial de la Propiedad Intelectual todavía está negociando y discutiendo la protección de nuestros conocimientos tradicionales desde el punto de vista de la propiedad intelectual. Entonces, si nosotros... Este, o los países dicen, bueno, los pueblos indígenas tienen que poner su conocimiento que sea disponible y accesible a todo, lo vamos a poner al dominio público y entonces ya eh, luego este, vamos a perder el control sobre ese conocimiento y probablemente, como ocurre en muchas ocasiones, no exista ni respeto ni reconocimiento eh, a esas contribuciones que los pueblos indígenas estamos haciendo. Y sería una violación a nuestros derechos humanos fundamentales específicamente sobre nuestro patrimonio cultural, que es lo que nosotros tenemos y lo que hemos heredado de nuestros antepasados y lo que tenemos la obligación incluso de pasar a las generaciones futuras. También, y acá este, me olvidé mencionar la meta 3, 
la, si bien es cierto la meta 3 no está, este, digamos, eh, nosotros eh, hemos propuesto texto que es eh, que las áreas protegidas, esta meta lo que propone es que se creen áreas protegidas, eh, que se aumente la creación de áreas protegidas eh, en un 30% al 2030. Eh, lo que nosotros eh, queremos en esas metas son tres elementos. Una es que eh, haya reconocimiento a las tierras, territorios de los pueblos indígenas, pero no como áreas protegidas u otras medidas de conservación, sino específicamente, porque ese es un derecho humano fundamental para nosotros, y otra es que no queremos que se creen áreas protegidas sin el consentimiento libre, previo informado de los pueblos indígenas. Nuestra propuesta está eh, que se incluya específicamente el término de eh, el respeto al consentimiento libre, previo informado, porque tenemos eh, la preocupación de que esta meta 3 pueda ser una herramienta que viole los derechos humanos de los pueblos indígenas. Entonces, por ese motivo es que nosotros queremos como este, una salvaguarda, como eh, que esté el respeto al consentimiento libre y previo informado. Y a su vez, el otro punto que estamos proponiendo en la metra 3 es el reconocimiento a, este, y el apoyo también a todo lo que hacemos por la conservación y la gobernanza de las áreas que son muy ricas en biodiversidad. Entonces, el sí. tema de... Thank you very much, Viviana, for that. No, I um, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm sorry. Entonces, eh, para nosotros es eh, para nosotros es muy importante en sí que eh, todo, todos ustedes puedan en sí en unirse a este proceso o contribuir porque es un proceso que puede, o sea, nosotros queremos, los que estamos en el Foro Internacional Indígena y todos los hermanos que están siguiendo las negociaciones del post-2020, lo que queremos es que sea una herramienta para apoyar las acciones de conservación que hacen los pueblos indígenas para proteger nuestra naturaleza y, eh, por supuesto, que si nosotros este, esto eh, eh, es positivo, también eh, va a asegurar en nuestro disfrute de nuestros derechos humanos, ¿no? Pero si esto no es un proceso positivo, eh, creemos que puede implicar también la afectación al ejercicio de nuestros derechos humanos. Por eso creo que es un tema muy importante y muchísimas gracias. Thank you, thank you very much, Viviana. Um, it's just a lot to learn and to go through in just this very limited time. But you're absolutely right that the our free prior and informed consent and our human rights is absolutely integral to having a successful implementation of this global biodiversity framework. As, as you know, indigenous peoples have been and have been known to steward the, their environments where they find themselves in, in ways that, that, that is sustainable and they provide an invaluable service to not only their ecosystems, but the world at large. And the world needs to recognize that and must ensure the recognition of indigenous rights related to that. With that, I would like to present to you our next speaker and his name is Mr. Preston Hardison. He's an academic uh, with a background in evolution and behave behavioral ecology. He's been working working on indigenous people's rights, biodiversity conservation, traditional knowledge since the early 90s. From 2000 to 2020, uh, Mr. Hardison has represented the Tulalip tribes until his retirement. He currently serves as a policy advisor to TEPTEBA and other indigenous organizations. He's worked with in the IIFB on, at the Convention on Biological Diversity from 1996 to present and at the Nyoga Protocol from 2001 to present. So uh, Preston, we are happy to have you here and excited to hear more about your impressions 
uh, related to the, the CBD meetings held in Geneva recently. However, we would like you to focus particularly on DSI. What is it and how, how it impacts indigenous peoples, especially as it relates to free prior and informed consent human rights generally, and benefit sharing issues. Preston, you have 10 minutes and the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd, I'd like to share my screen to make a, you know, for a presentation here. Uh, here we go here, share. Slideshow and all of the title bars in your plate. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity to make this uh, presentation. This is actually, I consider this to be a, a collective presentation from the uh, IIFB Working Group on Digital Sequence Information. Um, and here's the name of all the people that are involved. Um, we've been working on it now for about four years. It's exceedingly difficult and complex, and this is gonna be a challenge to get across some of the issues. Um, and digital sequence information actually is, is very challenging for both um, Article 31 of the Declaration and for um, the implementation of free prior and informed consent. And I'll, I'll get to the reasons why in just a second. Um, so just, just this kind of background. First of all, what digital sequence information is, is you have a, here you have a, a in this slide, you'll see there's a piece of a chromosome and those little bars across are actually two different amino acids that are connecting to one another. And then they have this protein backbone that, that uh, creates this little helical structure. Now they're only in DNA, there are only four different amino acids. And those four amino acids make up all the diversity of life. So the whole diversity of life is there, there's six, amino acids in the genome as a whole, but in, in, um, in, in all the cells, but in DNA, there's only four and those four amino acids make the, uh, all this biodiversity that we see and it makes us and all of our diversity. So out of these simple molecules comes quite a bit of complexity, but that also generates some problems. Now, the Nagoya protocol, um, in, in the CBD, if, if people remember or, or don't know, um, prior to the CBD, genetic resources were considered to be the common heritage of humankind. Um, there was a problem with biopiracy where developing countries were upset and they thought that um, they were being, their resources, genetic resources were being taken without any payments or any consent. So, in 1992, when the convention was finalized, um, they had a pass, the principle that the, genet the genetic resources were under the sovereign authority of the nation states. Um, but it also became important under Article 8J that um, access to traditional knowledge um, needed to occur with approval and involvement. And then that has evolved into a recognition that that is prior informed consent under the convention. And of course, we interpret that as free prior and informed consent. Um, and there's also a recognition under Nagoya protocol that um, there, in those cases where nation states recognize indigenous people's rights to genetic resources, they also have a right to prior and informed consent to genetic resources. Now, we tried to negotiate and we argued for our self-determined right for uh, over um, genetic resources, but that didn't, didn't uh, go through. But the door's not closed, it's just not universal. It, it it's only applies to those states that recognize those rights. Now, of course, we also know that indigenous peoples view genetic resources really as part of life essence or part of the life force, and it's highly sacred, um, fundamental part of, of life. And it's what, what gives um, all relations, um, gives all of their, their, you know, manner of being, and it connects all life uh, living things to one another. And we don't really view them as resources. But in the convention, 
um, the, the genetic resources are really biological samples and, and the samples were being taken by institutional research in, uh, institutions, corporate corporations for research and universities for research. Um, but and then this little red symbol over here um, is meant to represent the sacredness of these um, hered sacred hereditary material or life force that runs through all things. But again, the, the model also was about, um, in terms of indigenous peoples, was about people coming to indigenous peoples' territories and taking a biological sample, a seed, a plant, a plant part, um, an animal part, animal tissue, microbes, um, taking a biological sample and taking it out of their territories. And so there's increasing recognition that indigenous peoples have the right um, and say over uh, to prior informed consent over that. And of course, they also have the right to prior informed consent over access to traditional knowledge. Now, traditional knowledge in this model is viewed as something on the outside and it's applied to genetic resources. So it, it really is viewed as a lead to discovery for important qualities of plants, animals, microbes, and other living organisms. So, um, but it's, you know, just viewed as a lead. It's not internal to the actual genetic resource. Now, Nagoya also identified some problems with this model. We know that, for example, indigenous peoples often live in, in multiple countries, but they're still related because those boundaries are artificial, they're not their boundaries. And just through descent, they have, you know, all of their, their relation relatedness to other indigenous peoples and they will share knowledge they will share plants and animals and they share uses of those plants and animals so um you know here i'm illustrating with, with salmon so the nogoya protocol in article 10 suggested that there what should be a mechanism to deal with these transboundary because they thought well how do we get free prior, how do we get prior informed consent or free prior informed consent from multiple indigenous peoples that are widely dispersed, and also with, with genetic resources that are widely dispersed, and many times occurring outside of indigenous peoples' territories. So they proposed a mechanism called the Global Multilateral Biodiversity a Benefit Sharing Mechanism. And that was a, a, a mechanism for a fund that could be used for projects to benefit conservation. Now, what was interesting is that the model is based on, on indigenous genetic resources, but at the same on in indigenous people's issues, but in the actual language, it only mentioned conservation and didn't mention indigenous peoples, um, uh, other than being the basis of the fund. So that was kind of a problem. But this is the new problem we get to DSI. When, so DSI is the sequence of genes along a genome. That's in, and it's the information about those genes. So as I said, th there's a physical structure of these amino acids, but each amino acid could be represented by a letter. Say adenine is one and it, it's represented by the letter A. Well, in a digital sequence, all you, all you have is the letter A, the letter T, the letter U, and the letter G. And um, you can, so what these sequencing does is turns the physical structure of the amino acids into just a, all the uh, sequence of letters. And that's, that's what they're doing is they're sequencing those and using those. So they're not actually at, at that point, they don't have access to the actual physical genetic resource um, but the problem is then that, of course, that those letters, that sequence of letters is dependent on having had access in the first place. So we, we've argued, look, even though that is not the physical genetic resource, the sequence of letters is high, is totally dependent on that, that genetic resource. But here's another problem that this is running into is that in the original model, it was about coming on the indigenous people's lands and taking something from their territories, their recognized territories. But species are distributed across landscapes and seascapes. Um, they are distributed across different ownerships, 
uh, species are di uh, distributed across many sovereign jurisdictions, national and indigenous sovereign jurisdictions. And so you've got a problem that is not fitting with the standard biopiracy model because genes move on their own. Seeds disperse, pollen disperses, seeds can float down a river, they can uh, be dispersed on the wind. And genes, even for plants that are in the ground can, um, Ooh, I really, I've already used up my time. So, um, so I will have to go very quickly. Like I said, there's lots of technical bits that we're dealing with that make this very difficult. So imagine a species here. These are all members of a population of species and they're in all these different territories. And the only places that indigenous peoples actually control are their, their territories that they're on now. They don't necessarily even control their ancestral, the whole ancestral domain. So, in, and then also in terms of the work that's being done, there are trillions of these sequences being generated um, and there's huge databases that have them. So very quickly, what we've proposed is a, is a hybrid approach. Where we've said, if you come onto our territories, yes, you have to get our free prior and informed consent and we have to have a mutually agreed term. So it's what's called, a, it's a bilateral negotiation for a contract. But there, in these cases where species are widely distributed around the world and genes have moved very widely, it really would be very difficult to get for, for those trillions of sequences and, and the science that's producing them, it would be very difficult for indigenous peoples to even be able to have the capacity to negotiate agreements. So we said, well, why don't we have licenses that we can build into the licenses, the build in the rights and build in ethical guidelines and make sure that the uses of these sequences are not harmful and not, not offensive to indigenous peoples. But there could be a fee that was attached to their to the licenses and that fee can go into a global multilateral benefit sharing mechanism. In addition to fees, there could be non-monetary benefits. So for example, there could be agreements that um, there will be policies to enable land titling and the recognition of land rights and, and other kinds of things that would help in, uh, promote indigenous peoples uh, control over their territories and lands and to reinforce their traditional knowledge. Um, but the problem is in terms of FPIC and the declaration is that this does separate access from the benefit sharing to some degree. We would build some of the access um, issues into licensing, but the problem is that you can't really control all of the issues related to the genetic resources. So um, that's the basic model that the IFB has come up with. It's, it's not an ideal situation, but the thing is this model could actually generate lots of funds. And again, remember the funds would not be payouts. The funds would be used to support projects. A, and we've said we need indigenous peoples in, in order for this to work engaged and involved in the governance of the fund and in the governance of the non-monetary benefits and also in the governance of the um, what goes into the licensing procedures in order to, to deal with the scientist. Um, but it's really unlikely that we're gonna be able to do something that would actually give indigenous peoples free prior and informed consent for all of the genetic um, information in all of the species that they use Again, because they, they move away from their, their territories where they have this direct control. Um, and then finally, um, we need to move beyond the benefit sharing discussion. We have engaged on the ethics and the respect for the spiritual beliefs and in, in, in the research. We want to make sure that whatever research is done on the genome, that it, it is compatible with um, uh, the spiritual beliefs of indigenous peoples when it involves a resource. And again, finally, I want to really emphasize traditional knowledge that's exterior to the genome that still requires free prior and informed consent. And that anytime anybody takes anything directly from indigenous people's lands, um, that would also require free prior and informed consent. So that's in a nutshell, I, I uh, hope.
hope that people could follow and understand and I'm willing to answer any questions on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Preston, for that very enlightening topic. It's very technical uh, when we begin to talk about digital sequencing. And so I think you did a, a great job at explaining that. And you are absolutely right that as indigenous peoples, we don't see these genetic resources as resources per se. We see that they're all connected um, uh, to all living things and we deem them as sacred to our life, to all life forces, um, but particularly ours. And so I, I, I thank you for all the work that you guys have been doing on that. It's, very, it's a very complicated issue that requires thinking outside the box in terms of how do we find solutions to these and how do we ensure that the respect for uh, for indigenous peoples, because this is the absolute, you're absolutely right in that it's very connected to, to our belief structures and our systems. It's, it's sacred, it's, it's a part of our belief systems. And I like that you guys are looking at it from a, an ethical perspective and you know bringing that in to, to, to tie all of these complex pieces together. So again, thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate your time. And, and that um, for illuminating us on this issue. And with that, I would like to, uh, to introduce to you our last speaker and her name is Ms. Joji Carino. She's Ibalo Iragut from Caldilera, Philippines. And she is the senior policy advisor at Forest Peoples Program, UK based. Joji has been an advocate for the last 35 years on indigenous peoples and human rights issues and traditional knowledge at the local, national and international levels. She's an educator and a writer on the issues of biological, cultural and knowledge diversity. Uh, her current focus is on community-based monitoring and information systems. She is a co-lead author of the second edition of Local Biodiversity Outlooks. So I encourage you to look her up. Um, and so I'm excited to have Joji here with us today. And Joji, I know you were recently at the CBD meetings and you, I mean, you've been very engaged in, in, in this space and in these following these processes. And um, I had the honor of listening to you and, and learning from you. And I know that you followed indicators for monitoring the progress towards the post 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework and Indigenous Peoples' Rights. Can you elaborate more on this and, um, and what, your, what, what you think the next steps forward ought to be? You have the floor, Joji. Thanks very much, uh, Monica. I'll share my screen for the presentation. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I'll be talking about indicators relevant for indigenous peoples and communities in the post-2020 framework. Um, and I'll begin by just uh, situating us a little bit on this work on monitoring and indicators. So uh, local biodiversity outlooks um, looked at uh, our contributions to the existing strategic plan for biodiversity through uh, case studies written by uh, indigenous authors. And uh, there were some messages that uh, came out of that uh, assessment. First, that Aichi uh, Biodiversity Target 18, that was focused on traditional knowledge and customary sustainable use was not met similar to other existing IG targets. But only 10% of parties were engaging uh, us in the planning of the national biodiversity strategies and action plans. And in their reporting, they were just making piecemeal um, reports on projects and activities, rather than looking um, broadly at how uh, indigenous peoples are actually contributing 
very strongly to biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable use. And that the indicators that have already been adopted on traditional knowledge were not being used by parties in their uh, reporting. So uh, among the lessons here was that in this current strategy that's being negotiated, we have to be central actors that we are part of the national strategies and that uh, we will actually propose indicators to monitor the implementation of this 2050 biodiversity uh, strategy. So um, also in local biodiversity outlooks coming out of the uh, stories from communities, six uh, major transitions were proposed for inclusion in the post-2020 framework. A transition in land to secure our customary land tenure, in food for the revitalization of indigenous and local food systems, in culture to recognize and respect diverse ways of knowing and doing, in governance for inclusive and equitable decision-making, and our own governance for self-determined development in the economies, uh, sustainable use of resources and the flourishing of local economies rather than these global economies, which are actually very extractive, but also destructive of um, uh, life, right? And in incentives and finance, rewarding effective indigenous solutions instead of uh, subsidizing and financing destruction. So these were the types of big transitions that were identified and uh, they're color coded with the targets currently being um, negotiated under the post 2020 GBF on restoration, conservation and restoration, sustainable use, benefit sharing, uh, knowledge and information uh, and target 20 and equitable uh, decision making, right? So um, this is uh, what is being negotiated in the post 2020 GBF. And of course, this is what needs to be monitored. So um, under the existing uh, biodiversity strategy, Aichi Biodiversity Target 18 was focused on traditional knowledge and indigenous peoples. And there were already four adopted indicators to monitor the respect for traditional knowledge in the CBD plans. One was trends in linguistic diversity and speakers of indigenous languages, land use change and land tenure, trends in the practice of traditional occupations, and the inclusion of traditional knowledge and indigenous peoples and communities in all the CBD processes, especially national uh, biodiversity strategies and action plans. These indicators were actually adopted by the conference of parties. So um, this uh, followed a process, a technical process, wherein we had regional consultations and an expert conference to propose these indicators, which were then adopted by the parties. So let's look at how these indicators are currently um, playing out in terms of how they will, they could be uh, included in the indicators and monitoring framework. We are aware that the UN has declared the decade of indigenous languages. And so there is now a program of work happening around um, uh, indigenous languages. So uh, we are hoping that information generated out of this uh, process will be useful for providing the evidence and the data on the trends on linguistic diversity. In the present uh, list of indicators, we already have under goal B, the index of linguistic diversity. So, um, this is already in, included as a complementary indicator. Uh, we'll discuss later on what these uh, types of indicators are. In terms of trends in land use change and uh, secure land tenure, again, adopted by the COP, we already have indicators under the sustainable development goals, 
which are tracking this. For example, SDG 1.4.2, the proportion of total adult population with secure tenure rights to land with legally recognized documentation in who perceive their rights as secure by sex and type of tenure. Of course, this type of tenure includes customary tenure in collective uh, land, right? And um, there's another SDG indicator on um, the agriculture population with ownership or secure rights over agricultural land, right? But of course, indigenous peoples through our own monitoring, I don't know if um, we are familiar with the indigenous navigator. This monitors indigenous people's rights under UNDRIP, the SDGs and the outcome document, outcomes of the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. There's the registry of the international um, uh, on te territories and community conserved areas. And the International Land Coalition is also monitoring those indicators above these in the, uh, SDG indicators. Under the present GBF, there is already a proposed headline indicator under Target 21, which is land tenure in the traditional territories of indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, headline indicators are important because um, parties will have to report on the status of those indicators. Trends in the practice of traditional occupations. Of course, this relates very much to our entire management of our lands and waters and the occupations that we have, like um, hunting, um, rotational agriculture, um, harvesting, etc. right? Presently, there's not much, um, there are no specific indicators identified, although um, CBD had invited the International Labor Organization to explore the possibility of compiling data. But through community-based monitoring, we have actually been looking at the practices of indigenous peoples in customary sustainable use, including traditional occupations. There is a proposed indicator in the GBF which is percentage of population in traditional employment being assigned to the ILO. But occupations is a broader concept than employment because employment usually refers to uh, paid uh, employment rather than the full range of uh, work, both for subsistence, own use, and other work that we do. And so now ILO has developed a document on traditional occupations in labor statistics, which is a broader concept. Trends in which traditional knowledge and practices are respected through their integral uh, with uh, safeguards and our full and effective participation, right? Now, um, Indicators on the number of community-based monitoring of uh, traditional knowledge, innovations, and practices would be very important here and to see whether these are being respected and included in uh, national, uh, in the CBD processes, right? Um, mentioned was already target 20, the indicator on biodiverse information monitoring, including traditional knowledge. So that's in target 20. And of course, in target 21, indicator on the degree to which indigenous peoples and local communities, women and girls, as well as youth, participate in decision-making related to biodiversity. So we can see that uh, there are already um, a number of indicators there. IIFB, through its own working group on indicators, is proposing a greater number of indicators. And um, all of these indicators will need to be reviewed technically before adoption. Um, and uh, there is a process for uh, peer review of these proposed indicators. And they will be reviewed at a meeting coming up in Bonn uh, at the end of June, early July. I'll uh, move, uh, I'll not go through the technical process of um, this metadata. I'll move instead to the last. Uh, so the, see, this is the type of document being discussed in the 
uh, post 2020. They have the goal and the targets, and then they have the proposed indicators, right? Um, and as IAFB has its own table, we are putting all of these indicators. I just uh, move to uh, mechanisms and tools for implementation. Currently, we have working group 8J on uh, traditional knowledge and other articles. We're hoping that after COP15, we will have a permanent subsidiary on IPLCs, right? We are proposing this, of course, it's not yet agreed. And it will uh, develop a new work program. And under that should be also uh, monitoring and indicators. Of course, the importance of inclusion in uh, national biodiversity strategies and action plans, including a proposal, which is already there, focal points on traditional knowledge in the different countries. Mainstreaming of uh, traditional knowledge, the Sharm al Sheikh to Kunming Action Agenda, where we want to make our own commitment to uh, monitoring the entire framework, for example, through local biodiversity outlooks. And in our communities, um, establishing and strengthening community-based monitoring and information systems. And IAFB is working on this through its own uh, working group on indicators. So sorry I went a bit over, but uh, everyone is um, invited to understand this work because in the end, the statistics and expertise on the situation of indigenous peoples is completely in our hands. So the main source of evidence should be from community-based monitoring and from our own systems of information. Thanks very much. And I'll uh, close here. Uh, back to you, Monica. Thank you very much, um, Joji, for that for your powerful presentation. It is a lot to, to digest and to learn. And you're right, you're absolutely important. Uh, it's absolutely important that our views as indigenous peoples are taken into consideration as we monitor these indicators. Absolutely. Um, and so with that, I, I think we do have some questions. And so we will go to the question and answer session. And I, let me just give me a few seconds to locate those. And I believe the first question uh, asks, since 1997, what are the advances in the rights of Indigenous peoples? We have made a complaint since that time, and it continues to be violated, violation and continuous exclusion. So I'm not sure which one of our esteemed panelists want to take this one, um, uh, but since, so uh, the floor is open to either any one of you to answer that question. If not, I can I can nominate somebody. I can answer <laughs> as I was. Yes, go ahead, uh, Viviana. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think so, um, the situation is 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 really worrying because uh, the human violation is is high at that moment. But at the same time, we always try to have like a human rights um, instrument, human rights processor or mechanism to protect our rights. I feel that the, the situation could be worse if we don't have that uh, for this is or hope that is the GBF or the Global Biodiversity Framework is a tool to promote and ensure uh, human rights and not to violate human rights. And this is our main challenges for us. But uh, I, I really, Things that we need to use this tool, use the mechanisms to protect our rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Viviana. And the next question I think is perhaps uh, best answered by, by Preston. It says here, thank you for the opportunity to learn. How can indigenous peoples or languages uh, give uh, the authoritative name for a species for all outside users and not be controlled by DSI? How do proposed targets 12, 13, 17, 18 respect and support implementation of ONDRIP and WCIP outcome documents? Well, I wanted to first just also address the last question. I, I think 
I mean, we're in perilous times. Um, human rights are being violated in a serious way in the Ukrainian and Russian war. And um, we're also finding the rise of authoritarian regimes now. Um, on the other hand, in the CBD, there's some real hopefulness. Um, we have human rights-based approach mentioned in, in multiple places. When we first started, um, the mantra was whenever we said human rights, he said, well, we're not a human rights body. And we'd say, yeah, but you don't make human rights anyway. It's not your jurisdiction to make and author them, but it is your obligation as a state. You have a, you're a duty bearer. You have to implement those human rights. And we're actually now seeing a recognition of that. Now, at the end of the day, it will depend on what's on the table when we go to the, to the COP where they make the final language and decisions. Because we also know we, we've often seen language up there that looks very favorable. And then when we get to the final meeting, it, a lot of it disappears. Um, but I'm so hopeful that we've had a lot of support by some very surprising blocks of countries. The European Union, for example, come out with some strong support for the human rights-based approach in different places. So that's really good. Um, in terms of the language, so here's the thing, and as I was trying to get across is how difficult it is um, when species move across borders to actually control things because you, then you're dealing with multiple sovereigns and they're not all favorable to us. They're the same ones that are creating the wars here. So um, one of the things that we, again, there's an initiative now um, to do what's called tracking and tracing, but they're, they're developing uh, cult, biocultural tags. And so one of the things you can do is start tagging species names with the traditional names start asserting those names, but also with these tags, you can put in, here's what we expect you to do with these species. It's not a legal approach. And, and again, this is right now, we're not in the space where we can get a full legal approach. Because So for example, we know, say a, a bird, a songbird that that's, um, flies from South America up to North America and it's, it's you know Northern breeding season. We know that it's still a relative. We know it's still sacred. We still know that, you know, there's there's connections to it and relationships to that bird. But in terms of the legal definition, um, say the bird starts in Argentina, Argentina owns it when it's in Argentina and Canada owns it when it lands in Canada. And that's the legal situation. And, you know, CBD does not really have the authority or the power to, to change that directly, but we can you know, we can start asserting um, the, that's how you start. So if we get the human rights based approach into this framework, it's a 30 year framework. And then we also start, you know, engaging in these initiatives and asserting the rights. They're not going to happen by magic and they're not going to happen overnight. But if, if we consistently, and this is again, back to Joji and the indicators, we say, here's our indicators. And we start tagging things with our values there's some scientific work now uh, proposing that a lot of the existing species names get turned into indigenous names. And I'm, I'm all for that too. And there are scientists that are naming them in indigenous names and changing the common names. So, you know, whether you can displace the whole apparatus all at once, but we can start doing that. And, and you know, again, with this tagging type approach, you can say, well, here's our values, here's our names, here's what we want Here's the respect that we want when you approach these things. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Preston, for that. Um, so let's go to our last, our last question. And it asks, are those SDG indicators and IPLC monitoring initiatives public? So Joji, I'll let you answer that. Go ahead. Um, Yes, the SDG indicators are being monitored and are completely available in the SDG pages. And those includes those indicators I mentioned. Regarding the um, other indicators on traditional knowledge, those that are adopted by the um, parties are also in the CBD pages and they have produced an information document stating how far these have been developed. For the IIFB proposed indicators, which are currently under negotiation. Um, we will need to, uh, you need to get in touch with the IIFB 
we're in we are currently putting in our website the status of the negotiations that are happening and the proposals that IAFB is making. So we have a table of proposed indicators. It's being refined, which will be used for the technical expert workshop. And yes, this would uh, need uh, a lot of input until they are adopted. But after that, uh, th this will be completely made available, like the indigenous navigator, which is also publicly available. And everyone who wants to do uh, community monitoring should uh, participate. Um, the mechanisms for that will still be uh, set up. Thanks. So, Joji, there's maybe one other question that, that you might be the best person to answer, and it's from one of our um, Spanish speakers. It says, how can we monitor the, ad the advances or repetition of indicators that are imposed and outside the reality of communities uh, of indigenous peoples? Yes, um, this is why we need to have our own uh, monitoring guides and indicators so that those that are most relevant for us, we actually report on and we can actually hold uh, governments accountable when they are making commitments that they don't um, follow or implement or where they are actually uh, creating violations as a result of their actions or strategies. So the best... Um, counterpoint and the best um, counter evidence for accountability are our own reports if we do carry out and uh, generate the data and evidence for the real outcomes and um, situations in our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Joji. And I know in the interest of time, we're running out of time. So I would Perhaps, um, Tina, if you have any closing remarks that you would like to share with us, you have one minute and then maybe we take, uh, we'll go around and for everyone else to, to give their closing remarks. So we'll start with Tina. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica. No, I think um, a lot of the things really came, came about, but I again wanted to also just um, highlight the importance of ensuring that uh, in the global biodiversity framework, it is an opportunity for us to take. It's you know, I tell people it's 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 a break for us, you know, to be able to. Uh, how do we mold the gender plan of action to ensure that even um, indigenous women and girls can assert their rights through this gender plan of action? Like I said, it has got very good elements in there, which is to strengthen the implementation of the global biodiversity framework. Um, like I said, there is a need to see how women's and girls' rights, in particular to indigenous women and local women and fisher women, is able to be integrated in uh, human rights, like realistically, right? And I think it's really very important. And I think um, for, I would also say that please approach, you know, like I said, we have a momentum going for this standalone target on gender equality. If you see the importance of goal five at the SDGs, it is as if not more important, understanding that the SDG is a voluntary framework, CBD mm -hmm. is a convention. So if you're able to put this target and adopt it, uh, please advocate with your parties, take a look at it. How can we really strengthen it? Because if this becomes something in this framework, going forward for our younger generation, for the other young women who or girls who will come our way. I'm not, I'm not going to be in the CBD for 30 years. I mean, this is a framework. So if we can hook it up, then this is an opportunity for us that the ambitions of the future frameworks, this will become the baseline. You know, this is, so this is really very important. So I'm just going to kind of end there. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, too, for being here. I know it's very late where you are, but thank you for joining us. And with that, I'll go back to Viviana to give her closing remarks and then um, Preston and then Joji. Um, bueno, quisiera agradecerles profundamente por esta oportunidad y creemos que realmente el enfoque de derechos humanos en todo eh, el, el marco global es un elemento esencial. Eh, necesitamos asegurarnos que esto, este marco fortalece nuestros derechos individuales y colectivos 
y que este marco es una herramienta para apoyar las iniciativas y el esfuerzo que hacen los pueblos indígenas para proteger la madre naturaleza. Así que invitarles a, a todos este, que puedan conocer un poco más este marco, eh, debido al tiempo este es un tema muy complejo, no nos hemos referido a otros aspectos, pero sí creemos que es importante la participación eh, eh, de todos en, en este proceso, ya que va a tener un impacto en nuestras vidas diarias, positivo o negativo, y nosotros tenemos la esperanza que sea positivo. Bueno, muchísimas gracias y buenas tardes a todos. Thank you, thank you very much, Viviana. You're absolutely right that it's important that we follow um, these processes because it will have a direct impact on our lives. So with that, I go back to, to Preston for closing remarks. Thank you. And um, I mean, we're on, just realize we're on a bullet train. <laughs> uh, we hope to have this finished by August. I'm not sure we're gonna have our August meeting, but it, it, it was supposed to be done two years ago. So there's a lot of pressure to get this done. And there's a, this is a, going to be a 30 year plan. So whatever gets into this plan is going to be guiding the work of the convention for the next 30 years. Um, and then also just uh, understand we're it's really challenging because we have to get the indigenous rights respected in a, in a form of, of 194, 96 nations that are parties to this convention. And so in order for anything to get in the plan, it has to go through consensus. And again, this involves some of the very same actors that are acting very badly on the global stage right now. So um, we're, we're doing our best, but please get involved. Uh, please pay attention if you have suggestions or ideas. If you can get a collective process, you know, we always, what we, what we really need is, is local and regional processes where people get together and have meetings and have decisions and they come up with here's our recommendations because that's actually that's persuasive to the to the parties at the cbd or any un process um, so if you want to implement the human rights issues you know get together in your process and then study whatever con other convention that's outside the human rights system and and then come back with your recommendations and those are extremely helpful but again time is short we need you we need you to to pitch in and we're, we're always happy to get um, get information get input from from everybody because it's all everybody's collective rights and it's also your self-determination to decide um, what's acceptable to you and not what's not thank you thank you preston and joji in the interest of time you are up and I, I just want to say that I, I see more questions, but we don't have time to take them. So we'll just go to Joji. Uh, thanks. I'll just make a very short um, final remarks. In my um, reflection on the indigenous uh, movement through the years, uh, uh, there are two processes that stand out for me. Obviously, the 20 year negotiation of the UN declaration, which is a big collective effort. I think the current CBD process, which is a 30 year strategy, is the other process that we really need to pay attention to. Because here, the human rights in the UN declaration are being put into a text and convention form in terms of our relationships with nature, our relationships with our land territories and resources, traditional knowledge, sustainable use, so our very lives are under negotiation, actually. And uh, if we uh, do our bit, obviously at local level, convincing our governments and contributing to this global effort, I'm sure we will also get uh, good results from this uh, particular um, strategy that's uh, being negotiated. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Joji, Preston, Viviana, and, and Tina for this very powerful, powerful discussion. I know it was a short time and there's just so much to, to pack in and to learn uh, and to discuss, but I do urge you to get involved. And the, our panelists are absolutely right that this 
it will directly involve and impact us, whether it's negative or positive, but we, we hope for the best. And we hope that uh, the global as well as the national communities are, are serious about ensuring a human rights-based approach as we begin to, to implement these, these frameworks. And again, I thank you for joining us um, for this uh, webinar today. And I pray that you have a very good rest of the day or rest of the night, wherever um, you're calling from. I get Tina, thank you. I know it's very late there. And you all have a great day and thank you for joining us. And with that, we say goodbye.